So, but today uh, I'm yes, talking about uh, a little bit about the history of public art or so-called new gender public art and a little bit uh, about the museums in the history of Europe uh, or the European history and then about a little bit about uh, uh, site specificity and then in the end I put these uh, things together and talk about some recent art projects that in my mind have succeeded to bring forth something totally new and that have challenges the dichotomy between museums and public art. So, uh, <clears throat> today art can be public in numerous ways. Art can take place almost everywhere, whenever and in whatever form. The problem with the definition of public art is that all art is public by nature or a priori. Or, let's say, that no art is private. Art is always for the public, and its meanings are produced and transformed in social contexts. On the other hand, we probably share some notions of art in public places, and understand that this kind of art has a long history in Europe. <laughs> the notions of private and public are not always contradictory either, for example, think of Jürgen Habermas' definition of how uh, public and how the public sphere was made possible by private places and private individuals that form it a public. However, not everything in the public <coughs> is art. So, uh, I want to, I have uh, actually chosen some works to show you that are. Uh, not, uh, not totally randomly picked up, but a little bit. They are classic, so-called classical works of contemporary art uh, from 1961, uh, uh, the one of the very uh, well-known art piece by Alan Kaprov, Yard, uh, from 1961, and it's uh, Alan Kaprov who uh, actually found the idea of total art in 1950s, if I remember right. Uh, so, uh, they are not directly connected to what I'm saying here. So, uh, there are two terms I decided I want to a little bit define and go through. Uh, I don't know your kind of, uh, about your knowledge about the uh, contemporary art or the history of contemporary art. Uh, and, but anyhow, I decided to take up two, uh, two, two that kind of notions that I see are important when we talk about uh, public art today. And the first one is uh, the notion of site specificity. For, uh, and actually here, uh, in my kind of definition, uh, I follow a very famous and well-known uh, uh, well uh, uh, book or yeah, publication by uh, art historian Livon Kwon. Uh, and her book called One Place After Another, which is not very new, it's from 2000, where she discusses the changing role, position and form that so-called site-specific art has taken in the course of four decades. So, uh, Miwon Kwon finds three major temporal classes in the history of site-specific art. Uh, this is, by the way, the one of the very early <laughs> cases of site-specific art, uh, which is uh, connected to site. It's uh, uh, France, Daniel Burens, uh, 1968 work, uh, work that uh, then has spread all over the places, in, from Helsinki railway station uh, uh, to Guggenheim Museum, uh, these tribes uh, that uh, is a kind of uh, Say, uh, kind of concept that Daniel Buren has used since this, this year and is still using the uh, are they like eight centimeter stripes that uh, is uh, his art work of art. She, he has not done anything else, I think, since '69. <laughs> so, uh, um, 
yes, but he has done this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyhow, uh, Mivan Korn finds three major temporal passes in the history of site specific art. Site specificity's first stage emerged in the middle of 1960s in the form of so-called phenomenologically oriented minimalistic sculptures, which were situated outdoors. Here the real and active space replaced the previous autonomous and poor space of art. Later on, site-specific art developed towards a practice that can be characterized as a situational logic. The object was replaced by the verb or act, and the critical intention was pointed towards the viewing situation and practice. In the last third phase, site-oriented site art is the way in which both the artwork's relationship to actuality of, location, of a location or as site and the social conditions of the institutional frame as site as well are subordinated to a discursive determined site that is delineated as a field of knowledge, intellectual exchange, or cultural debate. And this long sentence was a direct quote from Ivo Kohn. Here, site is not defined as a precondition, but it is generated by the work and then verified by its convergence with an existing discursive formation. So, what has happened? Public art has transformed uh, uh, from local material sculptures which are, situate, which are situated in one site and are essentially bound to the physical and empir empirical realities of a place to a movable and transcendent idea of the work. The artist as well as the site. The work, the artist as well as the site. So, site can appear uh, as a stratified and heterogeneous space that does not necessarily have a fixed location anymore. Mibon Kwon sees a parallel between the mobilization of site-specific art with the nomadism of current site-oriented practices. She writes, quote, Paradoxically, while foregrounding the importance of the site, they together express the dissipation of the site caught up in the dynamics of Deterritorialization, the concept most clearly elaborated in architectural and urban discourses today, for them. So, Porn further defines her argument by saying that site oriented art wanted to stress the contradictory relationship between the deterritorialization of site in site specific art and the present context of an ever expanding capitalist order that is fully by an ongoing globalization of markets, technology and telecommunications. This general feature of contemporary urbanism, a drive toward a rationalized universal civilization, that causes the homogenization of places and crosses out all cultural differences, is the main target of site-specific art, he, she argues. One's focal argument is that site-specific art of the 1990s wanted to dismantle two things. On the one hand, the nostalgic and essential ideology that ties racial, religious and cultural identities together with geographical territories. On the other hand, it acted <coughs> against modernist universalizing tendencies, which with the of capitalist colonized the peripheral spaces. To do this, site-specific art had to first react site as it had been understood and treated, and then found it again. From this point of view, it is understandable uh, and easy to accept that site-specific public art of the last three decades has had have, uh, have been a melancholic practice, and it has attempted to reconstruct the notion of sight from the standpoint of having acknowledged its disappearance. So, uh, this is uh, the first concept, so the, the site-specific art, the art that is made in the specific place or site, and it's, it's somehow connected, even not very empirical, necessary. And the one other concept, uh, which is a kind of uh, 
kind of parallel to the site-specific art that was founded also around those years in 1990s was a kind of idea and a concept around the public art and it was actually a concept that then was quite widely used and uh, I don't know if, still, if, if it's still so much used but anyhow it, it in a way transformed me the idea how we think of public art and it's uh, the concept of new gender public art and it is new gender public art and it was introduced by an American artist and writer Susan Lacey in her uh, anthology, Mapping the Terrain, uh, and it was published in 1995. The notion of site specificity shares many characteristics with Lacey's notion of new gender public art. By uh, this concept, new gender public art, uh, Lacey meant art that is made in public space with different kinds of audiences and different kinds of people who might participate to this art process in various ways. So it uh, comes quite near about this, uh, what we are um, perhaps nowadays more uh, used to uh, hear, uh, the community art or participatory art. Uh, so that is maybe used today more. But anyhow, this new gender public art meant something very different than what was understood with the notion of public sculpture. The epithet new gender public art addresses something very different in it. It was art where, where quote, the artist spoke from locations directly linked to their community, libraries, churches, maintenance garages for city workers, convalescents' homes, elementary school and night night clubs. As later Lazy continues, again quote. Artists were dealing with some of the most profound issues of our time. Toxic waste, race relations, homelessness, aging, gang warfare and cultural identity. And those who attended, Lazy Continue, included not only students and arts professionals, but people from a wide range of backgrounds who had a special interest in the subject matter of uh, these artists. So and here is one of these, maybe uh, also one of the first uh, artists in, who made this kind of, um, uh, let's say, new gender public art. And here, the Laderman, Laderman Ukeles, uh, who here has a kind of project where she, as an artist, has decided to work as a cleaner of the museum. So uh, also change the position of the uh, traditional position of the artist and take a kind of other role as a cleaner of the museum <coughs> institution, which is also a kind of institutional example of institutional critique, art as an institutional critique. So, <coughs> so public art was uh, eventually uh, transforming from being durable and valuable object made by an artist to interactive processes that could consist of various kinds of socially, political, politically and, for example, ecologically loaded themes and contents. The outcome of this uh, kind of new public art was and is not is not still today necessarily a visible object, but a series of events lectures, workshops and social changes that might consist of, for example, performance, video, film, sculptural elements, photographs and so forth. So the change happened also on the very kind of representational level. So what distinguished traditional public art from new genre of public art was the way in which public space was understood. In the new art practice, the artwork is not about the object, as I said, but it is based on the relationship between the space and the audience. <clears throat> so, as I have argued elsewhere, uh, when we think of this kind of public art, When we, yeah, when we think of this kind of up, uh, public art in the cities or in urban spaces, quite often we can understand that one important place 
where this public art can take place is a museum or other kind of art institution in a more broadly sense. But not only inside of the museums or exhibition spaces, but in the more broadly context of the museum as a cultural practice that can consist of more uh, like consist of, for example, libraries, archives, events, cafes, restaurants, public lecture halls and uh, lectures. Uh, not only kind of museum that has collections on its walls or souls. So museums, and now I want to make this quotation mark around the word concept museum. Uh, so museum might commission the work or it might host the work in one way or another, inside of its uh, walls or outside of its walls, in the urban park or wherever in the world. One way to define the task of public museums in Europe is to think of their existence as contesting and challenging the notion of publicness and the ideolo ideology of publicity of the early royal collection that was representative of the po politics of absolutism or sovereignty. The ideal condition, condition of the public museum was created as a part of rising bourgeois political public sphere in Europe. The foundation of the British Museum in 1751 was revolutionary as it was the first public, profane and national museum institution in Europe. With the works of Fraser Ward, the museums contributed to the self-representation and self-authorization of a new bourgeois subject of reason. Essential to Jürgen Habermas' theory on the development of uh, the bourgeois public sphere was the idea of private individuals coming together to form a public that was defined by the supposedly disinterested engagement in the rat rational critical debate. Public museum was one of the places that facilitated this rational critical debate in the form of criticism and discussion that became a medium through which people appropriately part. In spite of its later discussed weakness, uh, Habermas' theory of the public sphere turns our thoughts toward the modern history of the museum and its democratic potentiality. In the history of contemporary art, we can trace the development of the museum institution where the emphasis shifts crucially from the represent representative publicity of the monarch to Habermas' bourgeois publicity, publicity of which the democratic new subjects of universal reason are a constitutive requirement. Um, well, yeah, one tangible example of this is the art of institutional critique that revealed the hidden sides of the museum and its power in 1970s and 1980s, and still does sometimes, like art, uh, uh, artworks that are criticizing institutions in their use of power, or some other aspects. The critical voices are heard within its own structure. If we still think of museums and their role in the public art and public discussions, we can argue that museums have across their history produced knowledge and created history with and by spatial organizations, diagrams, exhibitions, descriptions and interpretations. This is why uh, American art historian Donald Preziosi calls museum as smart machines, active instruments for staging and reconfiguring history and for producing new social subject for that history. This is quote from Preziosi. Museum is a place in which it is not easy to tell which is a spider and which the web, which the machinery and which the operator. It is a place at the center of our world, our modernity, in the image of which those worlds continue to proliferate. Proliferate, yes. It, <coughs> it is the means by which the modern Europe fabricated itself as a mirror of sense and brain, 
and the brain of the Earth's body. Quote end. So, according to Preziosi, museums seem to be places. Museums seem to be places where cultural re-evaluation and reflection takes place and happens. In that sense, museums are to be understood as discursive places that define certain cultural practices while they arrange material things and sometimes they change the material or immaterial things they exhibit. Museums should not be thought of as a shelters or inside institutions, but rather according to definitions of, public, of the public sphere, in which museums work on the border of the public and private, and continuously define their frames. This resembles so-called discussion of the Rome Parerga, which is Parergon, Ergon, it's a kind of uh, work and work Ergon and Parergon, which is a frame of the work that uh, Jacques Derrida discussed uh, in his book uh, The Truth in Painting. So the resembles Parerga that function in the work of art itself and with forces outside the work of art that determine its preferential meaning. Like, sorry, now I'm late. Like one example here, concrete example, where the uh, air conditioning or the ventilation system is uh, of the current Museum of Art in Pittsburgh has been transformed uh, uh, in a piece of art by Olaf Aurelius and your natural ventilation in inverted. So it's made visible the system of the museum or uh, ventilation system outside the museum walls. So uh, the institutional frame of the museum matches this argument as well. The paradox of this work of the frame that it both excludes and includes at the same time is that while it deprives and cuts works of art off from their so-called proper context, it provides them with different contexts. A kind of hermeneutic surplus value, where the subject, the viewer, can reflect upon his or her own, own understanding of the world we live in. That reflection can and should take various forms, also one that puts the subject, as well as the human culture, in crisis. Contemporary public art uh, has uh, <coughs> become aware of its museum context. While the museum itself has become self-reflective, contemporary art practices have outstretched the museum's frame in both discursive and practical tactics. This is another example uh, of that kind of practice where the same artist, Olaf Eliasson, has made a work, piece of work, very large ice floor in San Paolo Biennale, uh, where the work situates in and out of the museum <coughs> at the same time, the ice uh, floor. Today, each fragment of the world also, or reality, could be isolated and be, uh, by putting up a sign saying museum or a work of art. Even a landscape can be a museum, suggests Henk Overdui in one of uh, his articles. Or we can think of it also other way around. So, for example, again, Olaf Aurelius's work on uh, detail of a big installation where the mediate, mediated motion, uh, where the uh, landscape has uh, been transformed from the outside inside of the museum that has made a kind of so-called natural landscape. So, uh, what I mean about museums here, or museum, it does not have to be inside or something, or an interior space. Rather, I want to compare it with the laboratory, uh, idea of laboratory, in the way uh, Bruno Latour has taught us when he argues that when in times past a scientist worked in a closed site or laboratory, 
where a small group of experts gave it down phenomena that they could repeat at will through modeling before presenting the results. Nowadays the laboratory has extended, according to Latour, has extended its wall to the whole planet and, it's, and the instruments are everywhere. So uh, now uh, I realized something last night when I was doing and then I wanted to change the end of my talk and um, so now I want to suggest that uh, or I want to make a kind of test or experiment what happens if we put these two, two th things together today, 2017 or 2010 around museums as a kind of specific spaces that has a kind of species, specific intellectual history and as a kind of cultural institution and knowledge production that produces knowledge and beside it or put together a kind of new gender public art that works in the active way within society to create critical voices, new working methods and new ways to be together to be public, to be, to be agent in the world. Uh, so, um, so uh, when I really uh, yeah, was thinking this uh, lecture or presentation, I suddenly started, I was first wondering should I talk about this house and then decided not to talk of this house at all, but about something else. And then eventually, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, but now I start to understand what is going on today in the, art, in the global art, art, art world, in the very kind of avant-garde art. And now I want to uh, yeah, make a kind of uh, a little uh, tour how these so-called houses, as I will uh, show you, has been like used as a kind of public artwork, a public a kind of labo laboratory and a kind of cultural institution. That has something to do, not directly with the museums, but somehow uh, connect, anyhow, some, somehow uh, reminds me of the kind of working methods, what the museum has, in a way, uh, bring forth. And here uh, is one of, uh, I have a couple of these IHME projects and then a couple of other projects. And I'm sure that you all can find more of these examples. Uh, but I decided to take up these uh, examples, uh, I mean four examples, how the houses has been used in a very innovative way that combines a uh, kind of diff different cultural aspect and creative works. And these, all these four houses that I uh, introduce here now are uh, made up by an artist who uh, has uh, as a kind of artwork. So they are not houses for something, but they are both houses for something, but they are houses as a piece of public artwork. And first is Anthony Bormis uh, Play and the Collective Body, which was the first IHME project in Helsinki, 2009. And the Play and Collective Body uh, uh, yeah, brought together Play and Helsinki locals in the purpose-built unified pneumatic building and the public had the opportunity to work on and with a huge clay cube to use it to make objects of any kind, big or small, alone and with others. The clay was intended to be both a challenge and a sharing for the experience, allowing the opportunity for mediated, concentrated activity with the emphasis on non-verbal body communication. So and here you see the hall or building and here is uh, some images of inside of the building and the artist Anton Gormley there on the... Have any of you participated to the work? Only financial. So it 
was a uh, ten days, uh, so it was temporary house uh, made for people to make uh, sculptures of this uh, huge clay cube. And then uh, it was Gomez's intention that everything must be destroyed afterwards. So nothing is left. <coughs> so other, uh, so other also is a even project. Is even project. Uh, uh, yeah, because, and it's uh, the Israeli artist Yal Bartana's uh, film called True Finn. Tosi Suomalainen, 2014 made, and it was made in a house in Kirkonummi, uh, you see here, and it was the intention was to bring together uh, eight or ten people, eight, pe eight person, with different ethnic, religious and political background, uh, who all, everyone was uh, a, a Finn, so it was a kind of uh, a week where they uh, lived together in that house uh, and had discussions, assignments were filmed with the edited matter now forming the core of this artwork. So the idea was, Yael's idea was that what happens when these people live together for a week and really to find their business and themselves in relation to others. So uh, this is another, and there are some uh, clips from the film. Uh, so they were also filming. Uh, and yeah, is there. So this is another kind of creative uh, work, public work, uh, that was made in a house in a very creative uh, way. And the third happened, we <laughs> also Ihme artist, but uh, not Ihme work. Uh, this year's Ihme artist uh, was Theastro Gates from Chicago. And uh, he made 2012, a project in Documenta 13 in Kassel, uh, so-called 12 hours for Huguenot House, and it happened in the middle of Kassel city, and uh, there is, uh, on the left side is a publication, a cover page of the publication, there is the Huguenot House, and there is uh, people inside of the musicians and fashion page in the middle. So it was a, a project uh, in which the United two disused buildings, one in Chicago and the other in Kassel. And by dismantling parts of it to reuse in the rebuilding of the other. So Hugen House in Kassel was built in the early 19th century by migrant workers, as were so many of the houses in Gates, one neighborhood in Chicago. State of this repair. It is therefore proposed an architectural edge, exchange transporting materials from the dilapidated building or, and so forth, and not like Chicago building. And then some uh, images from the house. So there were uh, art students was uh, spending the summer there, and they were building and rebuilding a house and uh, making all. Uh, the black monks of Mississippi were playing, as you see here, and there were yoga sessions, and uh, and people can just enter the space and uh, wander around the house, and it became very popular this summer. And my last example. Uh, is also from, from the same uh, Documenta 13, 2012, uh, to a Greenford Danish artist, the worldly house that was a house, small house, 
in Karlsruhe Park in Kassel. And uh, yeah, when you entered the house, you could spend there several hours. It was a kind of uh, museum for uh, it was museum for non-human creatures uh, or multi-species co-evolution as compiled it by and presented by Tuve Greenford. There were artworks from several artists, uh, films by different artists and a kind of collection of uh, books or book library about the uh, uh, book that, uh, uh, what, what's it, book about a biologist or a book about uh, uh, animals and uh, ecology and about, uh, I don't really remember it, but uh, anyhow there was a kind of idea that it formed, it hosted the library and the kind of art institution or art gallery at the same time. And <clears throat> so this was the inside of the house where you saw like this is Marina Abramovic's early film but, uh, that is in this right pic uh, picture on the right side and there is this, uh, yeah, Computers where you can, an archive where you can uh, study the history of all the different uh, artworks that uh, has something to do with uh, animals. And so it became a kind of research laboratory or the kind of library or archive and arts, arts uh, space in, in very many level. So at these all these games, uh, works came to my mind last night <laughs> and then I somehow started thinking that okay I, I take these ideas with me here today and then to somehow make a kind of how minds operate when, when yeah, or in the associated level and then of course it was the background in my mind was uh, this house and all these events and things and also artworks that this house carries with it. So, uh, yeah. So, thank you. <laughs>